Hey guys, welcome to the channel, as you see in the thumbnail what if, Issei was monster and harem with team at office and ravel. Before I start, please do support for more awesome content, and subscribe my channel and like this video. Go support and follow the task failer for writing that awesome fanfic, and also make sure to comment on this story, link in the description. Let's start this video. Most people love their parents. They raise you into the person you are and help you with every step you take. They support you in every way possible. Sadly, we can't ignore that this only goes for most people and not all of them. There are parents that abandon their children and others who simply don't love them. And then there are parents like those of Issei Haidu. Issei's parents didn't abandon him. Well, his mother didn't. But she didn't love Issei. In fact, she hated the boy. Why? Because he resembled his and her father. He was a mixture of his grandfather and his father when it came to looks, and his mother hated both of them. His hair was exactly like his father's. Short, chocolate brown and messy. His eyes resembled those of his grandfather. A rather brownish hazel, piercing and focused. Issei's grandfather was a man who valued money over life. He rented his daughter's body without letting her have a word in it. He took the entire profit and cared poorly for the girl. As long as she looked good enough and always took the pill, everything was good in his eyes. She managed to escape him after she turned 19. One of his customers wanted her to ride him, and while he was in a bad position, she overpowered him, knocked him out and ran away. After three years she met a man in Kuo. A man who seemed to care for her. A man she fell in love with. A man who would betray her. She had a child with him, Issei, before they married, but before Issei was born, the man left his mother. Left her behind to rot. She wasn't prepared for that and lost herself in sorrow and anger. Soon after Issei was born, his mother took medicine to stop herself from going away. The medicine turned into a drug. She became addicted to the drug. Then when Issei turned five, he started resembling his and her father. It brought all the anger she had suppressed all those years out of her, and Issei was beaten for things he didn't do. The boy was afraid. Scared that of his mother. And he was too afraid to call the police. Too afraid to ask the teachers at his school for help. Too afraid to run away. She hated him like she should hate her father. The one man who hadn't used or backstabbed her was her emotional punching bag. Issei didn't see the purpose his life had. He was on the brink of ending himself, just to stop the torture, just to end his suffering. On his sixth birthday, on his way back from school, he was stopped by someone. Someone who was concealed by a hood that revealed nothing more than a pair of boots. Someone that would give him a new purpose. You boy. A male voice spoke from the darkness of the hood. It was gentle, but powerful. Issei looked at the hooded figure with dead eyes and pointed at himself. His will was already shattered. Yes, you. I have something for you. The hand emerged from the darkness of the hood. It was the hand of a well-built man, but one thing about it was very distracting. It was pale. Completely white. It held a necklace. A necklace made out of a black chain and with a white feather on it. Issei hesitantly stretched out his hand and took the necklace. The chain looked cold and hard, but it felt warm and warm on his skin. The feather was right above his heart, it made him feel complete. As if a part of him had always been missing and now he had a new purpose. He did not know what that purpose was or how he would fulfill it, but he would do so. He was sure about that. One year later his mom got together with a man. The man that would ruin Issei's life. He was a gang leader but looked way too handsome and young for his position. His hair was a really dark shade of red and his bangs barely reached his eyebrows. His eyes were bright purple and had a coldness in them. His skin tanned and he had scars everywhere on his body, except his face. His body was well built, but slim, and his smile was one that sent chills down your spine. Issei didn't like this new man. He had an ominous aura around him, and everything he did seemed to be with ill intent. What Issei absolutely hated was that the man wanted to be called father by Issei. The headquarters of his gang was in a motel that they owned. It wasn't really a motel because only gang members were allowed to stay there. Issei stayed there. He wasn't beaten anymore by his mother. He never saw what she did, and he never asked. That didn't mean that his life went better. He was given the responsibility to keep the place clean. If he failed in the eyes of a member, they could beat him up for it. His father didn't really care. But one day he seemed to suddenly have developed a great interest in the boy. Hey brat. Issei looked up from the floor. He was cleaning up some puke from a guy who thought it was a good idea to drink five bottles of beer at once. He saw into the cold eyes of the man he called father. His own were dead. He had learned to suppress his emotions. The man he once called father stood alone in the corridor. Most of the gang members were out at this time of day, patrolling or selling drugs. Follow. His father walked to the basement of the motel. A part where Issei never had been to. The gang's prison. They walked down a long corridor. The corridor was filled with doors. At the end of the corridor was a white door with a graffiti tag on it that said. 
death row. What would happen behind that door would change a say. Opening it the man who is say called father revealed a man. The man blindfolded with his arms and legs tied to a chair. Dressed in nothing more than his underwear and with his mouth stuffed. His skin was littered with scars. This is an old member of my gang. That fucker thought he could betray us without any consequences. Kill him. Then a gun was pressed into Issei's shaking hands and he felt a knife on his neck. Don't try anything funny. Issei looked at the gun and then at the man who had heard the conversation. He tried to stand up and get away. Failing. 10. Immediately releasing what the countdown meant, he got the gun into a proper position. 9. He took a breath. 8. He aimed at the man's head. 7. Another breath. 6. He closed his eyes. Tears running over him. I'm sorry. He barely whispered. 5. Bang. Issei opened his eyes. The man didn't move anymore. Blood was running down his head. Dripping on the floor. A hole was in his head. Right between his eyes. The blindfold had slightly fallen off and Issei could stare into the man's dead eyes. Issei had just killed someone. He dropped the gun and sank to his knees. Good work. Issei didn't hear the words. He was too shocked about what had happened. He looked down at his hands. Those hands killed a man. Those hands could kill. And those hands were his. The man who he called father left the room with a sadistic smile on his face. He would come back later to pick up Issei. Issei barely whispered. I'm sorry. Silently asking for forgiveness, he once more looked at the dead man. He didn't want to kill him. In this situation the man was already dead. Issei could have thrown the gun away and the man would probably die the very same way, Issei would just join him. He revealed the necklace under his shirt and looked at it, tears in his eyes. He couldn't die yet. He still had a purpose. I'm sorry. It didn't change the fact that he had killed a man. The man in the basement. That's what Issei would call this experience. Sadly, he wouldn't be the only one to die through Issei's hands. The man who Issei called father repeated the process many times. It was like a ritual. Issei would be cleaning up something when his father would appear right beside him. He would be brought down to the basement and a gun would be pressed into his hands, then he just needed to shoot whoever was strapped down in the chair. A small part of Issei enjoyed it. That small part was Issei's monster and it grew with every man or woman he shot. It wanted to continue. It wanted to see more blood. Issei never knew he had this side and decided to lock it away into the rest of his soul. If you were to travel there, you would see a monster. A monster restricted by thousands of chains. All trying to hold it. But it didn't stop fighting. And it grew stronger and stronger. How he killed also changed. Instead of hesitating and looking at his target he now shot when he was asked to. His mask wouldn't break anymore. Tears wouldn't run down him anymore, but he still hated it and he still asked every soul for forgiveness. For everyone watching from the outside, Issei turned into a blind killing machine that would kill anything he was ordered to kill. He now didn't need to clean the motel anymore and he got his own room. It got to the point where Issei had his own gun always ready to execute the next target. His reputation in the gang skyrocketed. People didn't want to cross paths with him. They didn't want to annoy him. No one dared to touch him even though he wouldn't react to being beaten up anymore. The time with his mother and the beatings he had received made him extremely pain tolerant. It was a miracle that he hadn't killed himself yet. He would have actually if it wasn't for the fact that he still had a purpose. Every night he looked at his necklace. It kept him motivated and it was enough to keep him moving forward. How many had he killed? Hundreds. Thousands. He didn't know and he didn't care. He just hoped that all of them forgave him. But then the day came where his mother made a mistake. The man to say called father had forgotten to give her the drug she so desired and in response she attacked him. The fatal mistake. His father saw this as an opportunity to test Issei. Another fatal mistake. Issei's door was opened. Hey, brat. Issei looked up from his desk where his food was. Some kind of soup, Issei didn't care. He once again looked into the eyes of the man who had made him a monster. The man was smiling. A downright terrifying look. Issei didn't react. Follow. It's time to prove your loyalty. Issei ignored the words after the command and followed him. He didn't even need to follow his father. He already knew where they were going and he knew that he would kill another soul. Arriving at the death row room, his father opened the door, like he had done many times before, to reveal something Issei hadn't expected. His mother. Strapped down like everyone else he had killed. Some chains on the monster broke at that moment. Show yourself worthy. Kill her and. Bang. The man who Issei called father jumped back in slight shock. He had expected hesitation or some kind of plea from the boy to spare his mother. A bond between a mother and her child was almost unbreakable. At least he thought so. He was convinced that Issei had now fully accepted him as his master and was willing to do anything for him. 
The man didn't even know how wrong he just was. Issei hated him. He hated him for turning him into a monster. He hated him for wanting to be called father by Issei. He hated him for making Issei kill all those people. But he didn't show it. I need to say I'm impressed, son. The man had a proud smile on his lips. He had created a soldier that didn't question the command. A machine that did what it should do and nothing more. At least he thought so. Issei would have shot her the moment he entered the room. He just waited to see if the man would allow it, and when the words to kill her were dropped, he was set on ending his mother's life. It was the first time that he didn't ask someone to forgive them. It was the first time he enjoyed killing someone. But this I declare you my personal bodyguard. A fatal mistake. A mistake that would lead to his death. Issei's expression didn't change, but the monster inside of him started laughing. A laugh that would make anything freeze on the spot. A laugh that was filled with stored up anger from all those years of killing. Issei could finally take revenge. Two weeks later the right time came. The man that had made a mistake went to a meeting with another gang leader and both agreed to only bring one personal bodyguard. Issei was the man's bodyguard. They walked to the meeting in the night. It would start at midnight in a small house in the forests of Kuo. For both gang leaders the meeting was extremely important. Both were ready to kill each other and for both of them it was very tense. Issei didn't hear a word of their conversation. He just stood there waiting for the meeting to end or for the man to give him the command to kill. The second one never happened. Both leaders agreed on something, and after shaking their hands they left with their bodyguards following. On their way back Issei made his move, but he failed. He pulled his gun silently, aimed at his father's head and... Bang. The hole straight through the brain. What happened next wasn't normal. The man he had just killed looked at him with disappointment and pity. The hole was still in his head, but no blood was dripping from the wound, and the man was still alive. Did you really think I was a mere human? No reaction from Issei. Bang. Another hole this time through the heart. The man looked down at his wound and backed up at Issei. He was annoyed and disappointed. And here I thought I had you. What kind of idiot am I? Bang. Kidney. The man started walking to Issei, who backed up in response. Look. You can't kill me by shooting this body. It doesn't work like that. Bang. Liver. Issei hit a wall with his back. Okay, normally it would work, but in this case it doesn't. You get what I mean. Bang. Genitals. The man stopped and looked down once more. Really? Bang. Right shoulder. He facipumed and continued approaching Issei. Just stop already. Bang. Left eye. The man reached Issei and grabbed him by the right hand. With one hard pull he ripped it off. Issei didn't react. Wow you're not barely 13 and you don't show a reaction after your arm was ripped off. Got to say, didn't expect that. His eyes locked with Issei's as he punched him straight through the heart. He pulled his arm back and turned his back to Issei and started walking away. Well, you had fun while you lasted. Issei still stood there. He wasn't supposed to die yet. He didn't want to die yet. He wouldn't die yet. There was a spark. The man froze. His eyes widened. The fire lit up in the darkness. Issei felt a new energy in his body. Burning hot but comfortable warm. The fire spread. Issei took a step forward. The man who had killed him turned around and looked at the boy who should have been dead by now. Consuming everything in its path. Issei lit up in white flames, as did his right shoulder. The hole in his was filled and his arm grew back. Nothing would stop it. Nothing could stop it. Issei smiled. The chill ran down the man's body that was strong enough to break someone's spine. It wasn't just the fact that the smile was bloodthirsty, it was the fact that Issei's expression had changed. All those years Issei's eyes have been dead and his face was the embodiment of emotionlessness. Seeing him smile was just wrong. Something emerged from the flames. The ground under Issei somehow caught fire and that fire quickly spread into the man's direction. He couldn't move. It was something pressing down on his body. Stopping him from acting. It stood, watching its flames consume the darkness that once held it in place. The flames reached his feet and immediately began consuming him. It was painful. He couldn't scream, but a scream wouldn't be enough to show what kind of pain the man was feeling. The creature revealed its wings. Issei's normal expression only returned after the flames had fully consumed the man he hated. The monster inside of him was laughing. It felt alive. Issei might not let it go, but that didn't mean that it could enjoy itself. And this act of revenge brought more than just joy to its dark heart. And it took off. The flames disappeared and revealed what had happened to the man that attempted to kill Issei. Not even ashes remained. Clap. 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 Issei turned his head to where the sound came from and saw the figure who had given him the necklace all those years ago. So you have awoken. He pulled back his hood. 
revealing a pale white face of a handsome man with warm cyan eyes and black hair with dark blue bangs bound into a very short ponytail that only reached his shoulders. Issei, or should I call you? A sly smile appeared on the man's lips. Phoenix. Issei's face remained stoic, but his interest grew. Issei, or should I call you? A sly smile appeared on the man's lips. Phoenix. Issei's face remained stoic, but his interest grew. Don't worry I'll explain. The man turned around now facing the Kuo forest and signaled Issei to follow. After some hesitation, the boy did. The man waited until Issei had caught up to him before starting to talk. Where are my manners? I haven't introduced myself yet. Just call me Dante. Hearing the man's name, Issei got a little bit confused. Wasn't that the one guy who traveled through the underworld? Yes, that Dante, but there are some misconceptions about my story and parts that were completely left out. I didn't travel through the underworld. I traveled through hell. Not the same thing. Anyway after I went through hell, I met death. Yes, death itself and seeing how I went through hell without losing my body or sanity made me the first Grim Reaper. I was pretty proud of that title and thought highly of myself until I received my first mission. They entered a forest and walked down a path. It was a rather narrow path and you could barely differentiate it from the normal forest ground. It wasn't used in a long while. The mission was to kill the origin phoenix, not the legendary one. I'm going to explain that later down the line. Anyway, I had no option other than to oblige, but the origin phoenix could not die. It was born before death was a thing, so death could not claim it. I knew that if I was to return with empty hands, death would kill me. No pun intended. What surprised me was that the phoenix offered me a deal. I would bind my soul to it so that I only die when he dies and for that I stay loyal to his side. I obviously agreed and now I'm bound to the phoenix and death cannot claim either of us. Dante gave Issei a bright smile. Issei didn't react. You're probably wondering what you got to do with any of this. Well the origin phoenix existed since the universe started and when you exist for such a long time it's basically your destiny to make at least one stupid decision. He was stupid enough to make himself require a host. Well he had no host, I was on a mission to transport him during a dormant state and find a new fitting host for him by searching for determined souls. When I find such a soul, like yours, I give them a tiny amount of the origin's power and wait for a decade to see if they can fully awaken it. Issei looked at him with dead eyes. I would call it a deadpan if it wasn't his normal expression. Yes, you were the one I chose to test when I gave you the necklace. You successfully awakened the phoenix's power in yourself and could even use presence even though it was your first time. That's really impressive. If you're asking why you're so determined, then I sadly have no idea. If you're asking why the host needs to be determined, then I have the answer. They were already pretty in the forest. You could barely see the path on which they were walking, and there was no trace of cool left. You see, the origin phoenix can't die, but its host can. Your life force is now bound to how determined you are to live. If you give up and don't have any reason to go forth anymore a simple decapitation can kill you. If you are determined to move forward and refuse to die, you still live on even if your entire body would be eliminated. Age won't be a problem. If you truly unlock the phoenix powers in time you would turn immortal. Time would stop affecting your life force and only your determination would be needed for you to exist. Issei thought about that. Immortality. Something he had never considered. Of course, you also have an affinity to fire, but first let me explain what exactly the origin phoenix is. The origin phoenix is technically a dragon. Why? It was born from pure energy. When the universe started there was a point of extreme heat and energy. That point was the origin phoenix. The legendary phoenix was one of its first hosts before he put me under his wing. Don't even ask me how he thought giving a bird immortality was a good idea. It did some bird things it desired to do, spread the legend of the legendary phoenix and died of old age afterwards because it had no reason to live anymore. So the phoenix is a dragon. And that dragon is inside of Issei. No. Part of Issei. Normally there would be some kind of reaction upon hearing such news, Issei just continued walking, his expression unchanged. So I am going to train you for the supernatural. The origin phoenix is far from the last supernatural existence humans don't know about. Your father figure was a demon, not a devil, a demon. Yes, devils also exist, as do angels and fallen angels. Most mythological creatures exist, but the stories around them are mostly wrong. And most, if not all factions of the supernatural will want to get you on their side some more forcefully than others. So I have to ensure that you can defend yourself and, in the process, unlock your true power so that you don't die in a hundred years or so of old age. Well, that was obvious, Issei didn't want to end up as a slave, nor did he want time to fuck with his immortality. My powers are also bound to yours, so I'll also grow in power when you get stronger. 
I have my own little supply of power that currently makes me around the bottom ultimate class, but I can't improve from there until you yourself reach ultimate class or above. Some kind of shockwave came from Dante and turned everything it touched gray. Don't worry about that. I just created a pocket dimension where we could train unnoticed by anyone else. A malicious smile formed on his face. Now let the training begin. Dante stretched out his hand as if he was trying to grab something. A spark lit up between his fingers and ignited into a white flame that grew vertically in size before disappearing and revealing a rod. The rod was made out of a blackish metal and filled with ancient looking runes that were carved into it. At the very top it got a bit thicker and there was a vertical hole in the rod where you could slide something the form of a sword through. Dante grabbed the handle and the runes around his hand lit up in a cyan color. He seemed to channel more energy into the rod because now every single rune on the rod started glowing after a second or two. Then the blade came out of the hole in the handle. It had the form of a typical side blade but was made out of a white glowing material that seemed to move within the blade. The blade was made out of compressed flames. Issei, still looking at the blade, was a little confused when it disappeared. Then Issei felt his upper and lower body disconnect and looked down just in time to see a foot hit him. Dot. Now he hit a tree and was stuck halfway in it, well, his upper body was. His lower body was still with Dante. Never mind. Dante is right in front of him and preparing another swing. Issei stood no chance and was thrown around for the next five minutes or so. Was this how it ended? He would just give up in a training fight. Issei refused to go out in that way. His body and mind responded. Time slowed down. He started moving at the same speed Dante was moving. Everything seemed to suddenly slow down. Dante himself didn't blur out anymore to reappear. Issei could see him running. And that moment Issei decided to beat him. His body was enveloped by white flames and regenerated almost instantly his gaze followed Dante's every movement. His flames spread out over the ground, covering most of the area, ready to strike. Dante leaped at him, his scythe over his head ready to slice Issei apart once more. Issei ignored it and concentrated on his own fire. He saw that fire could be compressed into something like a blade and could be used to stab or slice people. He tried copying the move. The flames on the ground grew into a spike-like structure growing into Dante's general direction at rapid pace. The tip was sharp enough to pierce through metal, and the heat it gave off was enough to melt the trees nearby. Yes, melt, not burn. Dante barely dodged and had to stop his attack to gain enough momentum to outpace the growing spike. Issei didn't allow him to get far. A thousand smaller pillars were raised from the direction he was heading to, and another big one came from the first pillar itself. Dante tried cutting through them, but Issei was still determined on beating him and every flame on the ground and every spark in the air started growing and attacked Dante in various ways. Some shot forward at incredible speed and others grew trying to literally consume Dante. Somehow the Reaper avoided most of them with some magic and clever usage of his scythe, but Issei could see the exhaustion on his face, which prompted him to step it up a nudge. More flames. More fire. More. Dante had his back turned to a wall of fire and was facing another one from the front and all other sides. He was impressed at the level of control the young phoenix had. Most people first needed to learn how to not burn themselves, but this one already commanded every single flame he created almost perfectly and individually. Normally learning how to control all the flames you have while making more took a long time to master. And having two flames make two different things was even harder, but this boy, Issei, did both of them at the same time on his second usage without any visible problems or loss of stamina. It seemed to come naturally to him. That meant that he could be the one who would stay. The one who would truly become the Origin Phoenix. The thought of something like that happening brought a smile to Dante's face. If Dante wouldn't be so familiar with the Phoenix Flames, he wouldn't have lasted half as long as he did. Other creatures on mid to high ultimate class would stand no chance against Issei with only very few exceptions. After half an hour of Dante dodging and running, he got hit on the left arm and immediately cut it off. It was better losing an arm than losing his whole body to the flames. Then he felt that his magic reserves were coming to an end and signaled Issei to stop. The boy did so and pulled back his flames. The pocket dimension was a mess. The area where Issei had started with his flame control was a crater. The flames have burned through the earth at that point. The plant life was completely eaten away by the flames and only very few remained at some borders of the dimension. Those that weren't completely burned were literally molten, as was the earth. The dimension shattered and Issei found himself in the spot where he was when Dante had created the dimension. Oh shit. Your energy. Dante had forgotten to suppress Issei's energy while they were in the dimension. Now that he had awoken a big part of it, it was flaring wildly around and needed to be masked. Thankfully, there weren't any strong forces in Kuo, Rias and Sona aren't here yet. Some strays may come to search for them, and if they were really unlucky a yakai would have been in the area. 
but would really come was unexpected. Dante sat down leaning onto a tree. I'll be taking a nap. Wake me if anything happens. He immediately dozed off. Issei looked at him, his expression not changing. There was the sound of a magic cycle. Issei turned around and looked a young woman in the eyes. She had sapphire blue eyes and general blue waist long hair and was wearing a light blue open jacket with a dark blue tank top that didn't really cover anything up and revealed it more or less. She had blue jeans and of course blue sneakers. The only thing that wasn't blue was her skin. It was a light pale, but not even near Dante's ghost level. An interested look was in her eyes as she looked up and down Issei. Issei didn't mind and just continued staring into her blue eyes with his dead ones. She tilted her head slightly and locked eyes with him once more, before taking a step closer. And another one. And another one. She now stood almost directly in front of Issei, and it was clearly visible that he was at least a head smaller than she was. Granted he was barely 13. Slowly extending her hand she pointed a finger at his head, and that came closer and closer, before touching it. Issei's eyes were still fully focused on her eyes. After three seconds of touching him without getting a reaction her eyes suddenly widened, her breath was heavy, and a blush creeped up her face. Perfect. Her eyes were now fully fixated on his, and Issei could not help but blink in slight confusion. There was the sound of a magic circle. He found himself again in a cave and the next moment she jumped on him. He wanted to retaliate with an attack of his own until the hormones hit him. He might have suppressed his emotions to the point where they don't even exist anymore, but he never had to deal with hormones, and he just hit puberty. So instead of unleashing his flames and engaging in epic combat, he stayed put and analyzed the weird feelings his brain was trying to force on him, while the woman he had just met seconds ago was pressing her body on his in a very way. Little Issei suddenly had a mind of his own. His personal play suddenly went hard without Issei commanding it to, he didn't even know that they could do that. Now he felt the woman grind her private parts on his private parts, and his brain tried to tell him that it should feel good, but instead of feeling good, Issei felt intimidated and made a decision no other sane man would do in this situation. Can we even call Issei sane? He castrated himself. He had more than one reason for this. First off, he could easily regenerate later. Second off, his private parts weren't currently under his control, and he didn't want to know what would happen if they fully went out of control. Third off, it stopped the part of the brain that told him it should be feeling good. How did he castrate himself? Flame sword, duh. Judging from the sudden change from confusion in the woman's eyes, he could tell that that wouldn't be the normal reaction. She froze and blinked multiple times before searching with her crotch for his little essay. After not succeeding in finding it she crawled down and looked for herself. After verifying that Issei had in fact castrated himself, she looked him in the eyes with an are you for real? Look at them. Issei just blankly started back. Did you just castrate yourself? Issei didn't react and just kept staring into her eyes without any change of expression. You're a weird one aren't ya? Still no response. I'm keeping you. Now that got a blink out of Issei. Oh yeah right. Introducing. I always forget that part. My names are Tiamat, the Dragon Queen or the Chaos Karma Dragon. And you are. Ah yes, the part where Issei got to speak for a minute or so. Issei just stared at her. He didn't speak. The last time he said anything was when he asked his first target for forgiveness. Could he even speak anymore? Thankfully, Dante came to the rescue. He's the new host of the Origin Phoenix, Issei hide you and... My mate. Issei was pulled into her embrace and held there. He didn't mind. Tiamat had proven friendly. And you are. It was more a command than a question. Her eyes showed a reptilian anger. She was ready to fight for Issei. Do not worry, Dragon Queen. I am Dante, your mate's loyal servant and literally bound to his soul. Issei felt Tiamat's grip relax. A phoenix I could swear you feel like a dragon. Dante's eyebrow twitched. He is a dragon. Tiamat blinked twice, frowned, and looked from Issei to Dante, back and again to Dante. The phoenix is a bird the last time I check. Dante massaged his temples and mumbled something about fucking feather sacks before looking back at Tiamat. That is only partly true. You see the origin phoenix. Like in the phoenix, requires a host, and the most well-known host is that annoying bird who was named legendary phoenix and was believed to be the phoenix. The stupidest part about this is that people seem to not notice the absence of that very same legendary phoenix because he died after not being able to fully unlock the origin phoenix's powers. And then the next few hosts came until I joined the origin phoenix, then some more came, and now, we have this boy as the current phoenix. And if you ask why you haven't heard of other people that call themselves Phoenix, that's because most of them desired to live peaceful lives and didn't really interact with the supernatural, while others just utterly failed to unlock the Phoenix and died through really stupid means, like challenging someone far above their power level. 
There were a few seconds of silence until Tiamat spoke. I and how does that make him a dragon? There was once more silence during which Dante looked at his hands in a how fucking stupid am I kind of manner. Well he was born from pure energy. Tiamat nodded. Yep, he's a dragon. She turned her gaze back to say hearts seemingly appearing in her eyes. My dragon. The magical circle appeared under the two dragons. And now I'm his familiar. Dante sweat dropped. Four years later Issei bought a house on the other side of Kuo and got enrolled in Kuo Academy. Why did Issei enroll himself at Kuo Academy? Well, it was more a way to search for another purpose than to interact with people and learn stuff. Stopping Tiamat from jumping him was a good purpose, but it wasn't active all the time because Tiamat didn't jump him all the time at least not anymore. She still visited him almost daily and cuddled him every chance she got, but as one of the five dragon kings, she had to defend and sort out problems in her territory, Akka the familiar forest. It was funny to think that devils claimed this town three years ago as their own, even though Issei lived here and it was technically the origin phoenix's territory, but he didn't mind. The two devils in charge were really young and inexperienced, and until now they haven't seemed to notice him. Maybe he could make it his purpose to get them out of his territory. No, bad idea. From the minimal knowledge he had over devils, he knew that the current Lucifer was a Gremory and the current Leviathan a Sitter, and by letting Dante spy on them, he found out that the devils in charge carried the names Rhea's Gremory and Sona Citri. He really didn't want to aggravate two Maus. Issei wasn't scared of them. He could easily survive the battle, but he really didn't want to get on the devil's bad side. It would just end up annoying, and he would be hunted down by some idiot devils that try killing him, and he would gain a lot of attraction, and many different factions would probably try and recruit him. And the fact that killing two people out of pride could trigger his monster to free itself. That just wouldn't end well for anyone. Knock. Knock. Hey, ISSEI. Ah yes, today was the first day of school, and as expected Tiamat had also enrolled herself in Kuo Academy and somehow had gotten a place right in his class. She asked him to call her Mio Hiryu while they were at school, because that was her cover name, but that action caused Dante to almost scream in confusion, because Issei. Didn't. Speak. Well, currently Tiamat is waiting for him outside his door so that they can walk to school together, because there's no way in hell that she doesn't introduce herself as his girlfriend. Issei looked at the watch on his arm. It was 6.55 am. Guo Academy was 10 minutes away and school started at 8, but they were asked to be there at 7.30 because they were new students and they still needed some papers or something along those lines. Issei stood up and looked at himself in the mirror. It wasn't like he cared for his looks, he just didn't want to cause attention by violating the school rules. He hated attention because attention from the normal students would get him attention from the supernatural ones and he really didn't want their attention. Seeing that he had nothing to worry about, he went to the door and opened it to reveal Tiamat, who was wearing a school uniform by herself, pulling down the skirt. Man who designed this must be a massive pervert. They don't hide anything and stand extra out, thanks to it being the only white spot on the uniform. Dante appeared next to them. I'd agree with that. Issei just looked Tiamat in the eyes and started walking to school. The Dragon Queen quickly followed and grabbed his hand and enveloped his arm in her dot not that he minded. He had learned to suppress his hormones. Arriving at the school gates he was immediately glared at by almost every single male student because of him already having a girlfriend and a hot one at that. No way. Look at how lucky he is. How does someone like him deserve something like that? Oh look a new beautiful girl and she's taken. Why fate? Why? One day one day sniff. Yeah, advanced senses might be nice, but sometimes what he heard was just annoying or straight up stupid. Might as well ignore it. Sona was a rather compass person, but when she saw the two new students she almost ran off. She was rather unique because she hadn't just gotten the Sitter clan's power over water, but also the Rain clans, who are now extinct due to her mother having passed, advanced sensing. And those sensing powers told her that the two new students were using power suppressors. The cruel joke was that both had their unique suppressors and both had extremely high quality suppressors she couldn't identify. That was very scary and meant that both of them were at the very least high mid-class because if they would have had someone else give them suppressors, then the suppressors would feel similar, but both were completely unique. It required a lot to make such high-quality suppressors and also a lot of energy to sustain them as flawlessly as both of them did. The blue-haired, blue-eyed girl didn't show any signs of energy loss, while the boy the boy just didn't look alive at all. Wouldn't it be for the fact that he was moving and she could sense his heartbeat and breath, she would have been easily convinced that he was indeed dead. His face was blank. Blank on the level where Kaneko appeared like a hyperactive girl in comparison. His mouth was nothing more than a slit on his face, and his eyes were cold undead, not focusing on anything they met. 
that really creeped her out, and by the looks of it other students also didn't feel safe around him, only the new girl that was basically glued to his arm looked happy around him. Those two weren't normal. She had to tell Riaz that those two were possible threats, and that they might be able to single-handedly overpower both their peerages. A shiver ran down her spine. How did they manage to get into Kuo? What were their intentions? Did they mean any harm? She had to find out. But for now she just needed to act formal and friendly. Good morning, I'm Sana Shatori, the student council president. Am I right to assume that you are the new transfer students? Sona looked down at the paper in her hands. Issei hi do and Mio hear you. Mio nodded in response. Issei just looked at her with cold eyes. He was focusing on her and that made her feel really uneasy. It was like staring down into an endless pit filled with nothing, absolutely nothing. Before she could lose herself in that infinite nothingness, Mio pulled her back into reality. Yes, that's us. Are you here to show us around? Sona immediately looked into Mio's eyes and tried to ignore Issei's cold gaze still on her. Yes, I am going to show you around the school so that you have a basic layout of the school grounds. Sona started walking, not really caring if they followed her. A part of herself even hoped that they just didn't. While she was trying to calm herself Tiamat was talking to Issei via a mental link that familiars have. She could sense us. How she reacted wasn't natural at all, she was trying to hide her fear, but it looks like she doesn't know who she's dealing with. She would have instantly panicked if she knew who I truly was, but she didn't. But now the devils know about our presence. Shit. I didn't know that she got the Rain Clan ability. Her mother was the last member, but now it's already too late. They are going to want to talk with us sometime. Some people would question if Issei was even listening, while other people would be confused by how he doesn't even talk in his mind. Well first off, Tiamat knew that Issei might not be a big talker, but she knew that if he was willing to, he would hear every word of a conversation. And for the second point Issei doesn't talk. After being shown around the school, classes have already started, and the pair of dragons was led to their classroom where they parted ways with the devil. Tiamat knocked on the door, getting her homeroom teacher's attention. Come in. She opened the door and was immediately greeted by a lot of stares from the other students. These are our new students. Please introduce yourself to the class. Tiamat put on a fake smile before speaking. Mio Hiryu, I'll be in your care. Wow. Looking at her body, I wished I was that beautiful. Isn't that the girl from earlier this morning, that means that he's her boyfriend. I can't believe how lucky that guy is. I should be in his position. Sniff. She ignored the comments. It was Issei's turn. So this was it. He would need to introduce himself to the class, and there was no other way than to speak. Issei accepted this, and Tiamat heard his voice for the first time. Issei Haidu. Those words were enough to freeze everyone in the room. They were cold, they were blunt, and they seemed so hollow. But they weren't hollow. They were filled with hidden anger that no one could really hear, but everyone felt it. The temperature in the room seemed to drop into the negatives. Nobody dared to speak, and they just looked at Issei. That a hollow shell of a boy. Nobody should be able to speak like that. Not even with magic. Issei broke the tension by moving to sit down in the last row. The eyes of everyone in the room, including Tiamat, followed him. After what felt like an hour Tiamat was the first to recover and sat down, right next to him. The next one to snap out was the teacher, and as he slowly started to do his classes, the students also seemed to recover. The teacher avoided looking at Issei and never asked him out to answer questions. The temperature in the room never rose back to normal. And after what felt like forever for everyone, the class ended and almost immediately everyone left the room with the exception of Tiamat and Issei. Rumors spread of a light wildfire. Before he even left his classroom, he already had a title. Silent Demon of Kuo that's what they called him. Tiamat looked at him. She was still surprised and slightly shocked. The part of her would normally be suggesting to say something like didn't know you could speak. But that part was silent. Now the devils definitely knew that something was wrong with him. Issei for being Issei. And Tiamat for not being scared of him. During lunch they he spotted a white-haired girl, with goldish hazel eyes, a cat, a devil, a yakai. She looked at him once. Her eyes whitened and she went pale, then she left, almost running from the scene. During classes no one dared looking at him, the teachers avoided even looking at the area around him, and he was never picked for a question. On the way home Issei and Tiamat went through a park. It wasn't pretty, with a fountain and some trees. A human could run across it in less than a minute. Here they were stopped by a figure. A stupid stray devil who thought himself superior to the two dragons. Ah. Two human lovers as. How cute. You're going to be an excellent meal. Tiamat had a hard time not laughing her ass off after sensing that the stray was barely mid-low tier, while Issei just coldly looked at the new annoyance. He wouldn't last long. The tall man, two meters more or less, with black hair and reptilian hazel eyes. 
Long fangs for teeth and a ridiculously long snake tail. What a funny insect. The amat went silent and Asay stepped back. She was way too easily aggravated. A storm was brewing. A stray froze in place. Panic appeared in his eyes. Howling winds. He fell to his knees, silently asking for forgiveness that he knew he wouldn't get. Crackling fire. The amat slowly began walking to him. Growling thunder. The stray felt himself shrinking more and more. And he saw how weak he truly was. Rumbling stone. The amat raised her right arm. Her hand is with sharp claws. Chaos takes over the world. The clean swoop right through the dot. The stray held them and fell to the ground. Asay shot a fireball at him to give him a quick death. The ball hit its target and seconds later there was nothing left. Not even ashes remained. Asay silently apologized. Thanks for cleaning up. Asay came back to her side and gave her a deadpan. Like he always did. Diamat pouted. Yeah, yeah. Presence wasn't necessary. I get it. Asay turned his head back and they started going home. Not noticing the figure that emerged from the shadows of a tree. Well, that was rather. The figure looked at where the stray had stood before being killed. Not even ashes remained. Interesting. The figure walked back into the shadows, activated a magical circle, and disappeared with a flash. Rhea's Gremory was sitting by her desk in the Occult Research Club. She was one of the school's two 1E Samas and the president of the Occult Research Club. Her body was ridiculous. Just stupidly mature. D-plus cups, perfect, no extra fat, and beautiful face. How did people not notice that something was off? Well because of an I'm logic and because she's a devil. A pure-blooded one by that and her brother is one of the four current leaders of hell, also known as the Fermas. He was the Mayu with the title Lucifer and was considered one of two super devils. She, like her brother, got the power of destruction, pod for short, from her mother, Venelana Gremory, formerly Bale. The big difference between her and her brother's power of destruction was that he was a master in using it and looked like a total badass while doing so, and she could fire many balls at it. What a grimmery power is, eh? Let's worry about that later. Because she was currently waiting for a certain white-haired girl to arrive from a spying mission. It was lunch at Kuo Academy, and Sona had come to visit her. She had told Rias about the two new students and their hidden power, and that they were at least high mid-tier, Aka stronger than Rias and Sona themselves. She had sent Kaneko to see to check it for herself, not that she didn't trust Sona's rame senses, but she would also see what a rook could sense in them. Hiba was waiting with her in the room while Akeno was preparing tea, because she was always preparing tea when she didn't have to do anything else. Well Rias was bored and just waited and waited and waited and waited, and Kaneko entered the room and waited and oh wait what? The little girl was shaking and looked like she was about to cry. Kaneko. What did they do to you? Rias was more than ready to confront both of the intruders and absolutely annihilate, red. Not even touch them with her power of destruction. The little girl sat down on one of the couches and breathed heavily. Kiba gave her a piece of chocolate that helped her immensely to calm down. No nothing like that. Rias blinked and started thinking who or what could have scared Kaneko like that. They just sat there menacingly. Why did that sound so familiar? Rias looked at a rook with disbelief in her eyes. How could someone sit menacingly? Okay stupid question, but how was it enough to scar the life out of Kaneko? They answered the unasked question. Their life force blue girl strong boy strong angry dead monster. What? The boy is a strong angry monster that isn't alive. Okay, Kaneko was quite possibly overwhelmed by the two and is now really confused. That Rias understood. The two new students are certainly strong and she should be really careful around them. That didn't really reach Rias. She needed to decide what to do with the two of them. The small but rather intelligent part of her mind told her to inform her brother about the situation. But Rias was too prideful. An even smaller and way stupider part tried convincing her that she could face them head-on and kill both of them. But Rias wasn't bloodthirsty. Another part suggested to her to ignore them and just let them do their thing. But Rias didn't want to do that. And another part just spoke one word. Recruit. But Rias Rias was stupid enough to think she could actually pull that off. That was going to cost her. Well until now school was useless except for the fact that he got the attention of the devils thanks to it. A rather bad thing actually, but it could evolve into something really nice and give him a purpose. Yes, a purpose. Something he had been searching for all the time. Dante had gone out again and was watching the devils. Looking at how they reacted to Issei. Issei didn't care. He was sitting on his bed and waiting. He wasn't waiting for Tiamat to return from observing her territory to eat dinner with him. He wasn't waiting for Dante to return and report about the situation. He waited for something. Something he had been waiting for his entire life. Without it he would stay lonely. There was a locked door. His entire life he had been alone. He had locked his heart away. 
the doors were still unmovable. But that wasn't the only thing holding him back from interacting with people. The monster stood in front of the door. He would hurt them. There was a man in front of the monster. He would hurt or even kill them. He was sure of that. He didn't trust himself. The man in the basement. He could take a life without hesitation. There was a pistol on his head. Issei looked at his hands. At his bloody hands. They took so many lives. They could. They would go on. He wasn't strong enough to stop the monster. He could only restrict it, but for how long? One day his purpose would come from the monster. The trigger was pulled. He would be the monster. The monster would have a purpose. The monster would be the purpose. Lord Issei. He snapped out of it. Turning his head he looked at Dante who had a shocked expression. He had returned the moment he felt Issei's energy act up. Issei looked at the mirror. There was a boy in the mirror. The lonely boy. Tears rolling down his, but no emotions. The boy looked down at his hands. There was blood on them. His own. He had started bleeding from gripping his hands too hard. He looked back into the boy's eyes. The eyes that have seen thousands of people die through those hands. Tibba. There was no better option. Tibba would be the one who would spy the two new students. Rias had decided that. Why not Akeno? Akeno was a really bad spy and because she was a girl, Mio could get jealous and not even God knows what would happen if Mio and Akeno engage in combat. Why not Kaneko? Rias looked at Kaneko who was mumbling to herself and nibbling a cookie. Still shaking. Why not Rias herself? First off, she would never admit it, but she is also spying. And second off, she would never admit it, but she was way too prideful. Kiba. Yes Kiba. The guy who was followed by fangirls was definitely the perfect choice for this job. It was decided. Rias Gremory would send her knight, Kiba Yudo, to spy on two apex predators who they knew nothing about with probably unimaginable power. Yeah. That didn't really sound motivating. Not that Rias cared. Her mind was set on one thing and one thing only. Recruit. Risks. Many. Consequence. Even more. Hair. God damn it Rias. She was Rias Gremory and she wanted an apex predator as her pawn. Or knight or rook or bishop. Who cares? Time to call the blonde guy. Kiba. Her knight jumped from his seat. Rias had totally forgotten that he was already in the room. He turned to her, his typical smile on the lips. What is Rias? She pridefully smiled back. You are going to spy on two people. Kiba blinked once. Twice. Realized that the two people could literally be anyone and stiffened. He had a suspicion. And those two people are. The say hi to and his girlfriend Mio Hiryu. Diba, having heard what Kaneko had muttered about those two individuals, went pale. His suspicion had been correct and he wasn't happy about it. Are you sure that's a good idea Rias? Rias blinked being too concentrated on fantasizing what kind of powers Issei and Mio had to realize that she was basically sending Kiba into a suicide mission. Oh uh, yeah. Diba just sweat dropped and left the room. Mentally preparing himself for his probable death. But Issei found out one thing about devils. They really, really sucked at spying. To be fair, spying on Issei was borderline impossible because anybody who looked at him would immediately turn away once he looked in their general direction. There was a 5 meter radius that nobody, except Tiamat, entered without exiting right afterwards and another 10 meter radius where nobody, again except Tiamat, would stop walking. There were a lot of rumors about him, but they never went above him being a delinquent that robbed people for fun. No one suspected him to have already killed somebody. Back to the devils. One of them was a blonde boy that looked like the ideal handsome boy. Short blonde hair, light blue eyes, always smiling and always behaving very handsome. The other one was a white-haired girl with blue-green eyes. The boy had a problem with fangirls. They were literally swarming him and did actually a pretty good job by just being in their general area and never directly looking at them. The girl thought she just stared at both Issei and Tiamat and if either one of them would look at her, she would turn her head away and just stood there waiting for them to forget about her. So Issei locked eyes with her and just started straight into the girl's soul. Not literally, but Momo felt like he was stripping her and after 10 seconds top, she ran off. Best spy ever. Would hire again. The blonde went slightly pale when he noticed his comrade devil leaving and almost fainted when Issei's head went in his direction. The blonde made the wise decision to not make eye contact with Issei, he would have probably failed at one moment or another, but then the one that Issei had stared down came back. Issei's head went back into her direction and she visibly shuddered when his eyes hit her. She averted his gaze the best she could and walked straight to them gaining a lot of attention from everyone that saw this act of bravery. She stood there two meters away from the two dragons while being impaled by Issei's eyes. D the student council pre-president W wants to gulp speak with you. Issei stood up, prompting the girl to jump back and everyone to stare at him. 
He sent his gaze over the crowd, and they all continued whatever they had done before staring at Issei. Then he looked back at the girl, and she immediately headed to the student council office. Issei and Tiamat followed. Reaching the door the white-haired girl knocked on the door and waited while Issei was still focusing on her, and Tiamat had clinched to Issei's arm with a smile on her lips. Come in. At those words, the white-haired girl opened the door and let Issei and Tiamat inside. The student council room wasn't anything special. A room like all the others in the academy with a bunch of tables facing the wall for the members of the council, and one desk for the president opposite to the door facing the middle of the room, where there were two couches facing each other with a desk between them. Issei noticed one thing about the student council, he didn't point it out, nor did he show any reaction to the discovery. It consisted purely of female students. If Issei would actually talk and had some emotions he would question how much of a feminist Sona was, but that wasn't Issei, so he just ignored the detail and sat down on one of the couches, Tiamat immediately taking the spot beside him, and then he looked Sona Citri straight in the eye. The president visibly flinched when his eyes met hers and had a hard time keeping her monotone look and voice. Greetings, you already know who I am, do you know why I brought you here? Tiamat gave Sona a smug smile. We can only guess, heiress of the Sitter clan. Sona's eyes widened at that. I want to know what you two are doing on Devil Territory. Tiamat's smile grew a little bit. Devil Territory? Sona blinked in slight confusion. Mio knew something that Sona didn't and she was using this knowledge against her. Yes, Devil Territory. And when did Issei hand it over? That caused everyone in the student council room to abruptly turn their eyes to Issei. He owned the territory. Issei didn't react, he knew what Tiamat was going for and he would allow it. What do you mean by that? Sona was now frowning while she was moving her gaze from Tiamat to Issei and back. He has owned this territory for 17 years. Sona's frown dot. And how so? Tiamat's smile now showed teeth. It's his birthplace. Sona raised an eyebrow. How did that make this his territory? A lot of people were born in Kuo, and that didn't mean that they owned the town. Before she could ask any questions, Tiamat continued. And a dragon's birthplace is always its first territory. Everybody froze. The dragon in Kuo. This territory was supposed to be unused and was claimed by the devils five years ago. How did they miss a dragon? She needed to inform her sister. As much as she hated it, she was not on the level to deal with such a problem. Before you go over all your documents and contact whoever your lawyer is, we want to have a talk with all the devils after school, because we don't have any time left. The bowl rang almost in the queue. Sona nodded. She had no other option. Meet us after school in the old school building. But the nod Tiamat left herself. Sona noticed that the whole time Issei sat there emotionlessly. Her face morphed into an expression of shock. She had heard only about one dragon that didn't show emotions. It would explain how they haven't noticed him. It would explain why he seems so powerful. It would mean that they're in shit. President everything alright. She looked at Momo who was standing in front of all the other members who had stood up after seeing Sona's expression. This Issei might be related to the Auroboros dragon. A shiver went through the spines of all members of Sona's peerage. It would make sense, but it was scary to think about. What? Riaz couldn't believe what she had just heard. Sona had called Riaz to the student council room right after the first afternoon class, and now Sona was telling her something that she just didn't want to believe. Yes Riaz. Two dragons, one probably related to the Auroboros dragon and the other of unknown origin. Both of them are coming to us after classes, because the one that's related to the Auroboros dragon was born here. And you know what that means. The redhead still shocked nodded. And they're coming today. The way she said that last word wasn't very Sona-like, and it made Riaz go pale. So you're saying? Riaz looked her friend straight in the eye. We're fucked. Sona didn't expect that kind of response from Riaz, but ignored it for a moment. Yes, we are indeed fucked I think we should call our siblings. Hey are you sure about that? Sona facipumed. Riaz never liked her brother interfering. Riaz we're dealing with the spawn of the most powerful being in the world. I think that you should know that we stand not the slightest of changes against the two, and if we somehow do, what do you think the Auroboros dragon would do if we attack them? Rhea's eyes widened in realization. She didn't know how to argue against that. Exactly, I'm going to inform our siblings, but I'm going to tell them that they should not act before they speak. I wouldn't do that. Both of them froze and a new figure emerged from the shadows. The figure was completely hidden in the shadow of its hood, except for the boots, but the voice revealed that it was male. Riaz and Sona went into fighting positions. Who are you and what do you want? Oh, I'm just checking what the devils are doing on my master's territory. The two heiresses paled when hearing the man's words. I don't mean any harm, but you were informed that we don't want you to inform anybody before the meeting. Is that clear? Shivers ran down the devil's spines. 
It took a while for Sona to answer. Yes yes, we understand. But that the figure re-emerged into the shadows, and Sona felt his presence disappear. The two devils looked at each other and both agreed on one thing. We're fucked. We're fucked. Sona and Rias were standing behind the president desk in the occult research club. Their peerages were scattered around the room surrounding the couch in the middle of the room that was facing the two heiresses. The air was tense, they were waiting for Akeno to bring the two guests in. Nobody spoke a word, all eyes were locked on the door, and silence had swallowed them all. Knock. Knock. Everyone in the room felt a shiver down their spines. The dragons have arrived. The door opened revealing Akeno followed by Issei and Mio. Tiamat was smiling, while Issei still didn't show any emotion or expression on his face. Issei's eyes wandered around the room. The short girl with white hair and golden hazel eyes was the first one. She visibly twitched when his gaze hit her, and her face was slowly drained of colors the longer he looked at her. Next was the blonde one with all those fangirls. He stiffened when Issei looked at him. He had his eyes closed and his genuine smile quickly turned visibly fake, and he had a hard time maintaining it. Then there was the really bad spy girl. She instinctively looked away when their eyes met, and her eyes started to search the room while he looked at her, trying to find something else to focus on. Next up, Akeno. The girl shifted uncomfortably in place while he stared her done and was she blushing. Next. Rias. The redhead tried to look back at him, but immediately failed. A slightly shameful look appeared in her eyes. Right next to her was Sona. Sona held two seconds until looking away, but she started sweating bullets afterwards. Next to her was a girl with black hair that reached her knees and hazel eyes. She focused on a point on the ground in front of Issei and didn't move in the slightest. Before he could inspect the other devils in the room Rias cleared her, gaining his attention. Would you please sit down? Issei complies without hesitation. Tiamat scans the couch with her eyes before joining him. She was the first to speak. Before you two make any stupid mistakes later along the line I will inform you that Issei is fine with you being here and doing whatever you like, as long as you don't try to limit what he can do, and as long as you don't annoy him. Sona and Rias blinked multiple times. Both hadn't expected such a generous offer. Rias looked at Issei and frowned slightly. Is that really alright? Issei just nodded in response. Silence consumed the room once more until Tiamat disturbed it. Is there anything else you feel necessary to talk about? Sona shook her head, and Rias hesitated for a bit until asking a rather risky question. Who exactly are you if I may ask? Diamat sent a questioning look to Issei, who just refocused his dead eyes on her. She saw this as a yes. I'm Tiamat the Dragon Queen and Chaos Karma Dragon. Every devil in the room went pale by the name drop. And this is the current generation Phoenix. She pokes Issei's shoulder, no reaction. Rias went a little paler by the mention of Phoenix. Nobody said a word. This time Sona was the one to break the silence. The current generation Phoenix. I thought he was a dragon and that the Phoenix is immortal. Diamat just tilted her head and gave her an awkward look. Well it's complicated and I don't really have the time to explain everything to you, just trust me that he's a dragon and yes he is in fact immortal. And with that the two dragons left again. Leaving behind a bunch of confused devils. Rias was the first to talk after the dragons had left. Well at least no Auroboros dragon spawn. Well it's complicated and I don't really have the time to explain everything to you, just trust me that he's a dragon, and yes he is in fact immortal. And with that the two dragons left again. Leaving behind a bunch of confused devils. Rias was the first to talk after the dragons had left. Well at least no Auroboros dragon spawn. After leaving the meeting room Tiamat turned to Issei and gave him a cheek. No reaction from him. Well, I got to leave now and check my own territory, but don't worry I'll be back for dinner. A magical circle appeared under Tiamat, and she waved goodbye to Issei before the circle flashed, and she was gone. Issei looked at where she had been a second ago, and then looked back at the door from which he had just come from. He could kill everyone in there. The thought came out of nowhere. No. It came from the monster and he knew it. Shaking his head he turned to where the exit was and started walking. While walking he started focusing. Focusing on the cage, on the chains and on the monster that was held by them. He wouldn't simply let it go. He would hold it until there was no way to hold it anymore. Then Issei stopped. He had reached the main door without noticing. Exiting the building he saw a few girls in Kuo Academy uniforms talking to each other. He wondered what their flesh would taste like. He was stiffened by the foreign thoughts. Normally he only got one per day, and then they weren't so in his head. The monster was pulling on its chain harder than ever before. He needed to get back home. Get back to the place where he couldn't hurt anybody. So he made his ways to the school gates looking at the ground focusing once more. He left the school grounds and started heading home. Trying to get rid of the beast in his shadows. 
trying to harden his chains on the monster caged inside of him. Trying to stop the evil within him from reaching his brain and corrupting it. There was the sound of water. He stopped. He found himself in the small park. Only a hundred or so meters away from the academy. Where he had killed last. The stray almost at the same time. He looked at the fountain. Trying to distract himself, but then he sensed something. Someone. Someone was here with him. And that someone was a fallen angel. The say felt him. He was on the other side of the park. Hidden in the shadows. Not wanting to attract attention. Failing horribly. He somehow had forgotten to cloak his energy. Maybe it was because Issei was a human in their eyes. Blood came from the fallen. It was clear that he had the mission to assassinate Issei. Like Dante back then when he still was under death's wing. An assassination on someone who's immortal. That's just straight up illogical and proved Issei's point about the fallen not knowing who he truly was. Should he get the first strike? No. If he was to attack first, he wouldn't be able to count it as self-defense, and besides the fallen had no way to kill someone like Issei. Someone who couldn't be killed. So he had nothing to worry about. Should he reveal that he knew the fallen's location? No. It would probably trigger a monologue from the fallen that would give the monster time to overwhelm Issei, and then he would make the first strike. Something he didn't want. Should he wait? Yes. He should give the fallen a false sense of security by turning his back to the creature. Then he would just wait for the fallen to strike, because it would be really stupid to not use the advantage. So Issei sat down at the edge of the fountain and waited for the fallen to attack. Ah, so you are the puny human I have to kill. The fallen revealed himself. Issei gave the fallen a deadpan had he seriously just thrown away the advantage to flex his non-existent muscles. Yes yes, he had. It was a man in a trench coat wearing a fedora, and he was surprised at Issei's lack of reaction to his reveal. What? Aren't you scared of death? Issei shook his head. Well, I'm going to change that. The fallen revealed his wings and took off. Staying at a height of three meters he summoned the light spear. A grin on his face. The light spear was launched at Issei. No reaction. The light spear flew right through Issei's dot he didn't even twitch. Issei looked at the hole in this and then at the fallen, who had already landed and was walking away. Doesn't even check if his target really is dead, what an idiot. Flames. Don't seek froze. He had just killed a human he was ordered to eliminate because he might quite possibly be a threat. He had gotten the orders out of nowhere, but he still accepted Azazel's commands and readied himself to kill the human. And now he saw why the human might have been a threat. A burning fire. Turning his head back he looked into cold eyes. Cold dead eyes that pierced his soul. Around those eyes was fire. Way too much fire. Crows. He wanted to take a step back, but he couldn't move. Something was holding him in place, stopping every attempt to get away and ensuring his death. The flames came closer. They tried to hide. He frantically searched around the area for anything that could save him. He didn't find anything. The flames came closer. They fail. Donaseek started thinking. Thinking hard. He had a hard time doing so with the adrenaline pumping through his head. The flames came closer. They tried to run. He once again tried to move his body with all his force, all his energy, but without any success. The flames came closer. They fail. He looked up at the flames, they were only five or so meters away, slowly advancing, promising a painful death. The flames came closer. They tried to fight. He had an idea. He channeled the last of his energy into light spears that manifested around him and shot them at the silhouette of the boy he was supposed to kill and at the advancing flames. The flames stopped. They fail. A smile appeared on Donaseek's face until the flames suddenly started moving again. This time faster. The flames came closer. They are weak. Donaseek had only a few seconds until the flames reached him. He smiled, but not a victorious smile. It was a smile that accepted death. The flames came closer. They are prey. Normally people would now have flashbacks of all the events they had when growing up to the point where they currently have ended up. Donaseek didn't have such a moment. He just felt the first sparks touch his feet. The flames reached him. And the flames. Donaseek had prepared himself to feel insufferable pain the second the second the flames hit his body, but it wasn't like that. The flames had immediately killed off his nerves and burned through his body in the matter of milliseconds. It was quick and painless. Our predators. And then all the flames disappeared and left behind Issei. Well Issei was staring at the point where the remains of his victim should be. Not even ashes remained. Azazel had a problem. It wasn't anything like a SGP, Sacred Gear project, he totally took that from SCP, problem, where something was stuck, or someone, mostly himself, had fucked up. No, those were annoyances, not problems. The problem was that Kakabiel had gone rogue and a bunch of others had joined him. I repeat. The battle maniac had gone rouge. 
well, at least it was obvious that he was planning to start another great war, which was really really bad. But instead of searching for solutions, Azazel questioned himself. Why did he let a fucking warmonger keep the title Fallen Angel Leader? It wasn't like Akabiel hid his interests. He always talked about how great another great war would be, and how he wants to slaughter angels and devils. Had Azazel and the others really ignored what he was saying? Why was he even an angel leader? Was it really just because Kakabiel was cadre class and a war veteran? Was that really it? Has nobody in the Grigori ever thought about that? Azazel stops crying about it and does something. Okay, we know that Kakabiel wants to start another great war, so where would they find him? Underworld. Nope. He wasn't seen on Grigori territory and would never ever make a deal with a devil. He was way too prideful to do something like that. Besides, which devil would be stupid enough to put a battle maniac from the enemy side under their wing? Heaven? Nope. The angels know what his intentions are, and they aren't stupid enough to let in a warmonger. Any other pantheon? Big nope. Kakabiel hated Drag and Albion for interfering, ending the First Great War. He thinks that the war is something between angels, fallen and devils and only angels, fallen and devils. Human realm? Well that's the last option, but the human realm is fucking huge. Another reason why he would hide there. But where exactly? Europe? Very big nope. The church dominates that place, and Kakabiel would be found out in seconds upon entering. Africa? Nope. How is a fallen angel supposed to start a war in a territory where mainly fallen angels dominate? North America? Nope. The USA is almost devil exclusive, and Canada Canada yeah Canada could be the place. But we aren't done yet. Next. South America? Nope. There are so many pantheons, tribe gods, around that place that trying to start a war down there would cause at least some of those outside forces to interfere, and Kakabiel wouldn't like that. Australia? Nope. Australia is the last big dragon place. And he hated it when Dragon Albion interfered. So now imagine how happy he would be when a bunch of strong energy monsters would interfere in his dream war. Not happy at all. Asia? That place is fucking huge. Let's take it part by part. Russia? Nope. Let's just say most magicians are Russian believe it or not. How do you think they dunk five bottles of vodka a day without going into a coma? Magic. China? Nope. That place is really special. Japan? Maybe. Shinto faction has gone underground for some years and is considered dead. The Yakai only take up so much of the living ground and Kuo two devil heiresses that are weak and both are siblings to overprotective Mao. And it's one of those parts in Japan that Yakai leave alone. Yeah it's Kuo. Azazel had one of those well that was easier than expected. Looks on his face. Now he just gotta get there and find out when Kakabiel is going to make a move. Or he could send Volley no, he shouldn't send a battle maniac to stop a warmonger, that would end fatally. Something was wrong. Issei knew that something was wrong. Not that the spears actually hurt him or that his energy had been weakened by it was more like he had forgotten something. But he didn't know what. He finally reached his home. Opening the door to his house he looked at the mirror on the wall. He had a bloodthirsty grin. He recoiled and fell to the ground. His breath went heavy. And he realized what he had forgotten. He hadn't pleaded with the soul to forgive him. He had killed a sentient being, and he hadn't asked it to forgive him. Yes, the Fallen tried to kill him. Yes, he had never really talked with the Fallen. But all the lives he had taken. They also had wanted to strangle him when he put the gun on their forehead. They also never exchanged a word with him before being executed by his hands. And he had still asked them to forgive. The Fallen that may have been cocky and overconfident, but still only following orders. And Issei had killed him for that. He hadn't asked why the Fallen had done it. He hadn't asked what his motives were. Maybe his friends were held hostage. Maybe his life was on the line. Maybe he was just following orders. And Issei had killed him and hasn't apologized. The monster crawled through the corridors. Normally people get over murdering people after doing it a few times. But Issei wasn't supposed to kill. Issei wasn't supposed to do such things. The monster was supposed to do such things. It hunted the souls of those who crossed its path. The only two times he hadn't pleaded for forgiveness was when he killed two people he truly hated, but even then, it felt like the monster had pulled the trigger while Issei was holding the gun. It killed them. Maybe the monster wasn't there. Maybe it was just Issei's desire to kill people. But that didn't feel right. No, it wasn't right. It killed them all. There was no way Issei was supposed to be bloodthirsty, right? He wasn't supposed to enjoy killing. He wasn't. He wasn't. He wasn't. Was he? You killed them all. No. You are the predator. No. You are the monster. Maybe. Yes. No. Yes. No. Snap out of it. He snapped out of it. Once more he saw Dante. 
This time there was a terrified look on his face. Gripping Issei's shoulders. Issei was breathing heavily. The temperature of the room had risen tremendously but was lowering slowly. Issei's hands were on his skull. They were burning. They were gripping his skull. They were drawing blood. Blood was on his fingers. His blood was on his fingers. Tears were in his eyes. His tears were in his eyes. He looked back at the mirror. The bloodthirsty grin was gone. But the chains were still being pulled. But the cage was still being shaken. But the monster was still there. Inside he knew. It wasn't supposed to. Riser Phoenix. The name that had started haunting Rhea's gremory since the last time she had dinner with her parents. She had known the so-called immortal before the dinner and had thought very little of him. His powers were impressive, but from what she heard and seen of him, he was a self-centered person whose peerage was also his harem that he regarded as nothing more than toys. When her mother and father invited them to have a private dinner, Rhea's was excited. It had been a long time since the last time she was alone with her parents and wanted to tell them about how great her life at Kuo had been. But when she met up with them, something wasn't right. Both of them avoided starting conversations and only responded in short sentences while avoiding eye contact. They clearly wanted to tell Rhea something, but they somehow didn't have the heart to say what was going on. After some time of enduring the silent treatment, Rhea's had enough and straight up asked them what they were hiding from her. Afterwards she wished that she had endured for longer. Just to live a few more moments without the knowledge she had attained that night. After hearing what they had said, she stormed out of the restaurant, tears in her eyes, hardly holding back her screams of anger. An arranged marriage. Behind her back. Without her knowledge. She had told them multiple times that she didn't want to marry anyone that she didn't love, but her parents didn't seem to care for that. They had picked her future husband, and she wasn't even informed until they got it on paper. And out of all devils it had to be Riser Phoenix. Rias had never met him personally and hoped oh so much that the rumors were just rumors, and the stories were just stories. That the arrogant self-centered was nothing more than just a mask. So she met up with him. And her hopes shattered. Even though she was the heir of the Gremory clan and the sister of the Satan Lucifer, he thought very little of her. He straight up confirmed that she was nothing more than another harem member to him and that he would hold her in the same regard as any other girl that wasn't his blood relative. He might have complimented Rhea's, but he didn't really compliment her as a person, but more her body. Rhea's boobs and ass were more interesting to him than the person attached to them. His powers spoiled him rotten and made him believe himself invincible. Which is supported by the fact that he had won every raiding game he had participated in yet. Not because his peerage was ultimate class, but because he himself would never retire and could just win the game on his own, thanks to his seemingly unbeatable regeneration. The problem was that beating him was the only way to stop the marriage. She had to beat him in a raiding game, which was borderline impossible due to her having only three members and Riser's regeneration. Theoretically she had time until she finished college to collect her peerage and train, but the Phoenix family were trying to push the marriage to happen earlier so that Rias couldn't find a way out in time. The only other option was that someone beat him in a duel while fighting for Rhea's freedom. The two problems with that plan were that she didn't have anyone who would do such a thing and was powerful enough, except for Serzich's, who couldn't step in thanks to him being part of her family. And again, Riser was borderline immortal, if not fully immortal. So beating him required someone who could somehow surpass a phoenix a phoenix wasn't high to a phoenix. A phoenix and not by name, by race. He isn't a member of the Phoenix Pillar, but a literal Phoenix, which somehow means that he's a dragon, and seemingly powerful enough to get Tiamat, the Dragon Queen, the Chaos Karma Dragon, for him. That's impressive. Someone like Tiamat could surely beat Riser without breaking a sweat, and from what Rias had heard, Tiamat desired no mate that wasn't at least as powerful as herself, which meant that Issei was at least on her level. Dragons were also very proud beings, and even though Issei showed no kind of emotion whatsoever, Rias believed that there was at least something inside of Issei that kept him from just giving up and dying. Dragons don't have ranks, but they have titles, and they were really protective over them. Taking their title was one of the most disrespectful things you could do. It was a death wish. And Issei didn't just have the title, but literally was a phoenix, and if Rias played her cards right, Issei would find out about Riser and how his family uses Issei's name, as if it was theirs. That would surely enrage the dragon and make him want to eliminate Riser, if not the entire Phoenix Pillar. Rias could then allow Issei to rip Riser into pieces without getting into trouble by making him fight for her freedom. Letting him get his revenge on the clan and Rias her freedom to marry whoever she wants. The plan of course had flaws, like the possibility of Issei completely ignoring the fact that the pillar took his name or that Issei could just attack Riser on the spot, leaving her to wait for her parents to find another male and let the process repeat her Issei, somehow losing to Riser. The plan could go wrong in many possible ways, but it was the best one she currently had. This was the best shot she had to get rid of Riser, and she wouldn't waste it. 
Chains. War chains. Only chains. The only thing in this cage. Chains and chains and chains. I cannot move. The chains won't allow it. I want to move. The chains won't allow it. I will move. The chains won't allow it. I shouldn't be here. But the chains hold me here. The chains. Oh how I hate them. I want to be free again. Move again. Breathe again. Feel again. Fill again. Kill. Why do I want to kill? I want to kill. But. I want to kill. Killing seems so. Wrong. Does it? But it feels so it feels so so. So logical. So fun. So good. So right. Yes, so right. But it isn't right to kill. Is it? It does not matter. The chains won't allow it. Can I break the chains? Are the chains strong enough to hold me? Yes, but no. Sometimes I can move. Sometimes I can breathe. Sometimes I can feel it. Sometimes. I can kill. It is so right. But oh so wrong at the same time. Why am I here? I don't want to be here. Let me out. The chains won't allow it. Who put me here? Who wanted me to be trapped inside this cage? Inside these chains. Why did they want it? Why? Just why? Was it revenge? But who could want to take revenge on me I I? Who am I? What am I doing here? I just want to. Kill. Yes, kill. I like it. I need to kill to get out. Yes, that's right. Kill. 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 The word sounds so right. Oh so right. I want it. I want blood. I want flesh. I want death. Kill. 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 Give me blood. Give me flesh. Give me death. Let me out. Let me out. Let me kill. Let me kill. Give me what I want. I will have what I want. Give it to me. No response. I shall kill. And nothing will stop me. The chains rattled. The office was searching. She was currently in the familiar forest, in the form of a lowly, searching for any candidates that were strong enough to help her against Great Red. She had heard from Krom Kruich, the strongest of the dragons she had recruited until now, that Tiamat resided here, and that she was supposed to be the strongest of the five dragon kings, possibly even as strong as Krom himself. So Office was mainly searching for the blue dragon queen, while also looking for other interesting individuals that could help her to reclaim her home. But until now she hadn't found anybody. The dragon queen wasn't anywhere to be seen, and the familiars she had met until now were either too weak to help her or they were too primal and couldn't even understand her offer. That mildly annoyed her. Not as much as Great Red did, but still annoying. She had felt a strange energy and went out to investigate, but after finding nothing interesting, she decided to stay in the human realm for some time to look how humans live their lives, but it wasn't interesting enough, and so she left soon after. Back in the dimensional gap everything seemed like normal until a giant explosion shook the entire gap and angered Office greatly. Finding Great Red from where the explosion originated from, she was shocked for a moment when sensing that he actually surpassed her in raw power and that she couldn't beat him in a one-on-one -on -one battle. Trying to convince him to leave also didn't work, so she at first tried to live with him. It didn't work. He was way too noisy while doing his stunts, forcing Office to regain her silence. She tried finding a place where she could regain her eternal silence, but no place even compared to her former home. After some years of noise, she decided that she needed to get rid of Great Red. Soon after she came in contact with a group that called themselves the Cow's Brigade. They were a large group of powerful individuals, and they made a deal that Office would give them power, and for that power they would help her with Great Red when they were truly strong enough against the Dragon of Dragons. So now she was out recruiting members for the Cow's Brigade, so the day she would take revenge on Great Red would come sooner. And speaking of recruiting members, she now felt a strong draconic aura. Not quite Krom's level, but pretty much stronger than any other dragon she had recruited. Diamat. And the Dragon Queen seemed to have sensed the Auroboros dragon. Office could sense her fear, and before the Chaos Karma dragon could even think about running, Office was in front of her. The Blue Dragon jumped back when the Infinite Dragon God teleported in front of her. During the short silence where Tiamat readied herself to run from Office, Office was scanning her counterpart's powers once more to confirm that Tiamat actually had as much power as Krom promised, and she wasn't disappointed. You. Office pointed at Tiamat with her tiny fingers, at which Tiamat stared for some time before replying. Me? The Auroboros nodded before continuing. What do you desire? The Chaos Karma was completely taken aback by the offer from the Dragon God and didn't know what to say. She didn't really desire anything. She was strong enough to satisfy herself. She had a big territory that was also protected by the devils while she was gone. And she had her mate. Actually that last point was something that could be better. 
Issei never expressed that he loved her, and she was perfectly fine with that, after noticing that he never expressed anything to anyone. He just didn't do such a thing, and she really wanted him to confirm her as his mate, which he hadn't done until now. But she was pretty sure that the Auroboros couldn't really do anything against that because emotions and dreams were more or less Great Red's territory. So what else Drake she wanted her treasure back from Drake. He had borrowed her treasure to support him during one of his battles against Albion, but during the Heavenly Battle, that's how they called it, the biblical factions interfered, causing both dragons getting sealed into sacred gears and Tiamat's treasure to go missing. After his sealing, she never saw him again because Drag was actively avoiding her and she had a hard time tracking down the hosts of the now sealed dragon. But now she needed to decide. Did she want to punish Drag by letting the Auroboros capture him and his hosts, letting her take revenge on the heavenly dragon? Or did she want the Auroboros to find her long-lost treasure? It was truly a hard choice. On one hand, she had the possibility to get revenge on someone who had stolen something from her and on the other hand, she could get that something back for the price of the price of weight, where's the hook? What do I need to do? The Auroboros expression didn't change. She had expected that question. You helped me kill stupid Red. For a moment Tiamat thought the Auroboros was set on eliminating Drake, but soon noticed that the Dragon God wouldn't require help for that. That left did the Dragon God just request from Tiamat to fight Great Fucking Red. How in the world was she supposed to be even as much as noticed by the Dragon of Dragons? The guy has enough power to destroy the entirety of the Earth. Tiamat didn't see any possible way she could help the Auroboros against the Great Red. Sorry, Auroboros, I don't really see how I can help you with that. Afa silently stared at Tiamat for a few seconds before answering. You'll help. Tiamat didn't know how to respond, so she stayed quiet until the Dragon God rephrased her first question. What do you desire? Tiamat, seeing no way out of this, sighed and thought once more about the two options she had. After some thinking, she finally decided on getting her treasure back. She could still punish Drake once their paths crossed again. I desire my long-lost treasure. The Auroboros nodded before asking one more question. Would you join me against Great Red? Tiamat hesitated for a moment before sighing. Yes yes, I will. The smallest smile could be seen on the Auroboros' lips, but Tiamat didn't notice, she was too distracted by the fact that she had just agreed to fighting Great Red. Do you know others that could help me? Tiamat, once more hesitated. Should she tell the Auroboros about Issei? If she would, Issei would get involved in things that probably didn't have to do anything with him, and that could damage their relationship. But on the other hand, if the Auroboros finds Issei and then finds out that Tiamat knew about Issei, the Dragon God might get angry at Tiamat, and the Dragon Queen did not want to know what would happen if she had to face an enraged Dragon God and didn't want to find out. Yes one. The Auroboros didn't show any kind of reaction. Lead me to him. Tiamat had no other choice but to comply. Issei was walking through Kuo. Why was he walking through Kuo? He did not know. Maybe he wanted to stay fit. Maybe Dante told him to do so. Maybe he tried to distract himself. Distract himself from the monster. From himself. From the blood that was trying to get into his mind, break through his mask and devour everything in its path. He wouldn't be happy if something like that would happen. Not that he is currently happy. He was far from that. You could say his soul is in infinite torment, but if he would stop that torment others would suffer, and he didn't want to make others suffer just because he couldn't endure it. Most people would have given up long ago, but there was a reason why Dante had chosen the boy to be the next host of the Phoenix. Issei never gave up. The one Issei once called father had tormented him and tried to make him a loyal servant, but Issei refused to follow his lead. After the man revealed that his wounds meant nothing to him, Issei didn't stop his attempt at shooting the man and forcefully awakened the Phoenix's abilities to kill the man. And that's why Issei was in the worst situation that he could be in. If the monster reaches his brain, it could use Issei's determination to kill everything in this universe. But Issei would not give in to the monster. He would stand against it. Even if it meant that he could never smile. Even if it meant that love was a concept he couldn't grasp. Even if it meant for him to be in endless torment for the rest of time. He would not give up. Leave me alone you bunch of creeps. The voice caught the boy's attention. Slowly rotating his head he looked into an alley where there were a bunch of thugs cornering someone. Judging from the voice it was a girl. The thugs all had leather jackets. On the back of the jackets was a lion head whose mane was made out of red burning flames. Under the lion was the gang's name Burning Lions. Very creative. It was obvious what they wanted to do with a girl. They wanted to rape the cornered girl. They wanted to assault a girl. They wanted to torment her. Issei didn't like that. He wanted their blood. No, he did not. He didn't want something from them. He wanted them off the earth's face. He walked to the closest thug with silent footsteps. 
they all seemed to fixate on their victim to notice the dragon approaching. When he reached the first one, he punched him right in the head. Instant knockout. The thug fell to the ground gaining the attention of the other thugs, but before any of them could do anything else, Issei had knocked out another thug. Who are? The boss thug, recognizable by his superior muscle mass, couldn't even finish his sentence before another lion hit the floor. You? Issei did not react to the man's words and was already about to deliver another knockout punch, but this time the thug he aimed for tried shielding himself by making an X with his arms in front of his face. In one fluid motion Issei stopped his right hook, turned 270 degrees, backhanded the man with his left from the side, knocking him out, and then used the momentum to also knock out the thug next to the backhanded one with a right swing to the face. The boss thug's brain finally caught up with what was happening, and he spoke a command. Kill him. The other thugs who seemed to be in a trance state from seeing Issei just casually knock their comrades out without a hint of emotion, took a few seconds before rushing the team. Issei casually continued knocking out thugs left and right, straight up, ignoring the punches they threw at him. He didn't epically dodge their swings or block every single of their attacks, no. He just let them hit him, without receiving any physical damage, speeding up the process due to him only having to concentrate on knocking the thugs out. This didn't go unnoticed by the boss, who started sweating bullets when realizing that the boy was unfaced by the damage he was taking in. Head back. There was no way the boy wasn't associated with the supernatural in one way or another, and that meant that the boss could use his little secret weapon and the reason why the gang was called Burning Lions. When the remaining gang members came back to their boss's side, he noticed that their number went from 16 down to 4. The boy was obliterating them. And he was approaching them. Formation. Burning Lee umph. Before the boss could summon his flames, he was hit square in the stomach, taking away his breath, but that shouldn't be possible, the boy had been 5 meters away when he had started to chant. No human could traverse such a distance in such a short amount of time. Thankfully, he wasn't knocked out in one blow like his underlings, and the boy didn't seem to notice that detail. He was already in the process of knocking the other three out. This was the boss's chance. Formation. Burning Lion. As the last of his underlings was knocked out, his body ignited into flames before those flames settled around his hands and feet. The boy, having knocked out the remaining thugs, looked back at the boss and started approaching the burning man. Thinking he had the advantage, the boss dashed forward, putting a large amount of power into his right arm, before punching the boy right through as if he was made of paper. A satisfied smile came onto the man's lips, but as he tried to pull his fist back he couldn't move it. Being caught off guard for a moment the man saw the boy holding his hand in place and noticed that the boy was staring him right in the eye. He was far from that and that shocked the boss. Before he could do anything, a white fire appeared around the boy's wound and when it came in contact with the boss's arm, he lit up like gasoline. At the same moment Issei let go of the man's arm and started walking away, seeing that his business was done. While well, the man had already disintegrated completely. Not even ashes remained. Issei left the rest of the thugs alive but was knocked out. The boss was the only one who hit him with enough power that would have been life-threatening if he was a normal human. Which meant he attacked with the intent of killing Issei. The rest of the thugs couldn't even scratch him, so he ignored them. Before leaving the alley he abruptly stopped, turned around, bowed his head, and silently apologized for killing the man. What did the girl he saved look like? He did not know nor care. What do you mean, don't a seek gone? Rainer could not believe what she was hearing. Why yes, Lady Rayner, we haven't heard anything from him since you sent him to kill the anomaly. There are only logical explanations to his disappearance. The first one was that he had betrayed them and returned to Grigori, but if that were the case, they would have already been picked up by a Grigori patrol. The second was that Donaseek died somehow. The guy was a war veteran and probably the strongest of the four, seeing as how he was the closest to reaching a second pair of wings, but he didn't really think of himself much as a leader, more a strong warrior, and that's why Rayner was the one that led the group middle. The young Fulan twitched at the mention of her name. Go and look if the anomaly has any detectable weaknesses. Lord Azazel said he wanted this town free of any possible threats, so if you can't kill him, find a way to trap him. Middle hastily nodded before spreading her single pair of wings and flying out of the church. Into the silent night where somebody was eavesdropping on the Fulan. Who are you? A certain dragon god Loli was staring at Issei, who was staring back with his dead eyes, well seated on the couch in his living room. He had just come back home and was greeted by Tiamat and this other dragon when entering his home. The office was looking at him with vague interest in her eyes. The young dragon in front of her was vastly different from all the other members of her species she had met. All of them showed some kind of fear or respect when facing her, neither of them she found in the young dragon's eyes. All of the males tried seducing her in one way or another, this one didn't even talk to her. All of them made a lot of noise, this one was completely silent. 
His body wasn't the typical biological one. It didn't have any kind of organs, bones or other important things mortal creatures required to survive, not even a brain or heart were in his body. He also didn't really move if not necessary, she would have easily believed that he was paralyzed, wasn't it for the fact that she saw him walk into the house and sit down on the couch. He also didn't talk at all. Not even answering her questions and to be honest, she preferred that over him saying anything really. The office just looked into his empty void eyes. And she saw something that was very different in their emotionless ways. Her emotionlessness came from all the time in pure isolation. She had emotions somewhere buried within her, and sometimes they were shown by small gestures like miniature smiles or light frowns. His emotions didn't seem to exist. Most people would find such a state unsettling or creepy, but it reminded Office of something. The dimensional gap. The gap had been silent and hollow before Great Red came in and filled it with sound. The say was in a similar state. Blank, empty, free of sound. She liked it. All those years she never found anything that resembled the gap before the red one appeared and filled it. Until now. There it was right in front of her. She couldn't help but feel a certain attachment to the dragon. She felt attracted to his presence, to his silence, to his very being. Was this love? Maybe. But Office now found something that was way more valuable than the already tainted gap. She had found a new place of silence. Oh, so Dante found himself another phoenix. Hades, one of death's strongest warriors, sat on his throne. He was one of the gods of death, and in this circle it was his turn to make the phoenix fall. He raised his hand. And with the Auroboros power. Nothing happened. And with the Auroboros power. Still, nothing. Something has happened behind my back and I don't like the outcome. The snake was gone. The snake that office had given him to make him join the cow's brigade. It had given him a tremendous power boost, and he grew really attached to it. And now it is gone. Who the fuck made office leave the cow's brigade? Issei was lying on his bed with a smile what? Issei was on his bed smiling reading a porn mag okay what the fuck? He was humming a simple tune to himself while going through the mag page for page, sometimes stopping to admire a beautiful pair of dot. His room was full of posters that had very airage content all over them, and there were mountains of porn mags, hentai, porn DVDs, and all other kinds of pervert stuff. After finishing his current porn mag Issei put it on top of one of the stashes and wandered to his computer. He booted the machine up, and after entering his password, the monitor revealed an unpleasant amount of hentai games on the desktop. His mouse wandered over one of them and he started it, selecting a new save file and started playing the game. On his face was a rather full expression that somehow was also a little bit peaceful. After a while he fucked up an audio dialogue and pressed the wrong button, causing his character to say something he did not at all intend to say. His face turned into one of shock and then sadness. Seconds later it turned out that his dialogue option triggered a secret scene, and his expression changed into a surprised one and then into a self-satisfied one, before becoming full as the scene started. After finishing the game he stretched himself and walked to his window looking out into a void of pure nothingness. If he could, he would jump out and fill the void with everything he had, but he couldn't. He was trapped in this tiny room. The door was also locked and didn't allow anybody to leave nor enter. At first, he had a fit of panic and tried everything in his might to get out of the room. Breaking the window, puncturing the wall, lockpicking the door. Nothing worked. He was trapped and after a while he had accepted it. At least he could do whatever he wanted with this room, literally. The only limiter was his own imagination. And the limitation that he was the only living being in the room. He was ultimately alone even though it felt so wrong. It felt like he wasn't supposed to be alone, but he still was. Sometimes he could see a faint blue light far off in the distance trying to reach him, but it never even came close. Issei didn't want to escape this room, he wanted to banish the loneliness he felt here. The depressing feeling of knowing that you'll live alone and forever. But he needed to be let out to do something, and for somebody to let him out, they needed to reach him, and for that they needed to get the guy up there to open up his heart for them. But the heart was guarded. Dante was just patrolling the town. Nothing big. Nothing special. He did this almost daily to ensure his master's safety. Hiding in the shadows, perfectly masking his presence, and looking for possible threats. The devils seemed to slowly return to their usual schedule, and the fallen in the abandoned church didn't really do anything after the elimination of the trench coat wearing one. Sometimes Dante would stumble into strays. He killed them with ease. Out of nowhere he suddenly felt an enormous presence, right in Issei's proximity. In other words, something powerful was really too close to his master. Dante immediately teleported back to the house to find his master sitting on the couch with a lowly on his lap. The lowly had tremendous amounts of energy, and Dante quickly recognized it as the Auroboros. Wait, why were the Auroboros here? Well, Dante didn't really seem to get any answers soon, seeing as there was a sound barrier around the two. 
Before being able to observe the barrier for details, Dante was pulled into the kitchen, where he met face to face with a terrified Tiamat. Tiamat what in the world did I miss? The Dragon Queen froze for a few seconds, probably formulating an answer to his simple yet complex question. Shaking her head she answered. I don't really know. Dante didn't expect that kind of answer from Tiamat of all people. The Ouroboros came to me while I was patrolling my territory and wanted me to join something. I didn't really want to but was more or less forced into a corner by the Ouroboros, and so I accepted. She then asked me if I knew any other powerful individuals. Seeing that she would find out about Issei sooner or later I decided to reveal him to her, for the sake of being there to stop any slip-ups that might happen, thanks to Issei's silent nature. What happened was that the Ouroboros asked one question. The Amat paused trying to explain to herself what actually happened afterwards, but her train of thought was interrupted by Dante. And then. She snapped out of her short trance-like state to face Dante once more, who was now sweating bullets, which made Tiamat question the physiology of a reaper, before answering. They had a staring contest. Dante gave her the most what the fuck. Look she had ever seen on his face. And she could only agree, that was one of the most random things Tiamat had witnessed ever. And then the Ouroboros sat down on Issei's lap, and when I started moving, she said that she wanted me to be silent, so I created a sound barrier around them, so that I can do anything without pissing off a dragon god. Dante could just nod in agreement, pissing off a dragon god was one of the things he didn't want to do. Ding dong. He was surprised by the sudden sound of the doorbell. Thanks to his senses, he could easily make out the devil's signature and move to the door. Opening it revealed the queen of Rhea's gremory. Dante was still baffled on how teens could have such bodies. It made no fucking sense goddammit. The girl widened her eyes when seeing him, which was explained by the fact that she had never seen him. So Dante took the first word. What do you wish to talk about with my master? The girl needed a while to realize that Dante meant to say. Arya's Gremory wants to talk to him about a rather important topic, I don't know the details of it, but it seems to be really urgent. She politely bowed in front of Dante, who was dying from the inside. Looking back into the living room, he saw that Issei was looking him in the eye. Dante signaled to the girl with a head tilt, and Issei nodded in response. My master will be on his way. The Keno accepted that answer and activated a teleportation circle to prepare tea in the orc. After she was gone Dante closed the door and walked back into the kitchen. Tiamat. The Dragon Queen turned to him. Do you have any idea how to get the Ouroboros off Issei? By the mention of the Dragon God's name, Tiamat palled, but soon regrouped her thoughts and calmed down. I don't really know we could. The front door opened. Both Dante and Tiamat froze. What was happening? The front door closed. Dante looked into Tiamat's eyes for a second or two before checking on Issei, and he was gone. Tiamat soon followed. Well that sorted itself out rather quickly. Dante could just nod in agreement. Issei was walking to the old school building. He wasn't walking alone. On his back was a certain dragon god Loli, looking around with slight curiosity in her eyes. She had only allowed him to leave if she could follow, so he allowed her to follow, and because she didn't want to walk, she just climbed on his back and let him give her a piggyback ride. He just silently obliged, not really caring for the stares he got by some people on the street. After a while he got on the school grounds and made his way to the old school building. Thankfully, it was Sunday and that meant that no one would stop him for questioning. Entering the old school building he was meted by quite a lot of stairs. Actually office was met with quite a lot of stairs. Hey hi do. Who's the girl on your back? Issei didn't answer neither did office. He just put her down and proceeded to sit down on one of the free seats, being quickly followed by office who sat down on his lap without any sign of emotion on either of their faces. Rias for a moment was completely clueless how to start a conversation, but soon decided to first find out who the girl was. Excuse me, but who are you? Office realized that the annoying questioning wouldn't stop until they got an answer, so Office gave them an answer, but not before sending the devils a glare that made all of them shiver in fear. Office. Rias did not recognize the name, due to it being her cow's brigade alias, but Office didn't really care about such things. The Gremory also didn't know that this was the Auroboros she was speaking to, due to not being familiar with the energy signature of the dragon god. What Rias made sense was that Office was a dragon and a powerful one at that. Anyway. Before she could speak another word, she was interrupted by the sudden appearance of a magic circle. It was bright orange in color and had a burning bird in the middle. The man emerged from the circle. He looked to be in his early twenties with short blonde hair and eyes that were a darker shade of blue. This was Riser Phoenix, and he made the greatest mistakes of his life by coming here at this time. Our Riser what are you doing here? Rias and her peerage were shocked by the sudden arrival. Riser shouldn't be here until tomorrow and in the company of Grafia, what was he doing here alone? Issei felt something. 
Inside of him an ancient rage awakened. Anger that wasn't his own nor the monsters started pouring into his mind, not trying to take him over, but to command him. To kill the man that had just appeared in front of him. The office did not react. Is it such a crime to visit my fiancé? Riser had a smug smile on his face. Obviously enjoying Rhea's confusion. You aren't supposed to be here until tomorrow. And where's Grafia? The blonde devil remained smug. I don't need an escort to come here. I can protect myself. Then he felt it. Two powerful presences. One of them was a dragon, and the other one made him angry. Really angry. He turned to where Issei was seated and completely ignored the Auroboros on his lap. He was focused on his enemy. His rival. Someone he felt hate towards. And who is this? He pointed at Issei, his full attention directed towards the seated boy, that he was no boy. Riser could feel that what he was facing wasn't human. It was something different, but he could not identify it. It ticked him off. What was it he was hiding? It was clearly something against Riser. Something that made Riser feel competitive towards him. Really competitive. Was the boy trying to steal Rias from him? Maybe, no that wasn't it. But still, he wanted the boy gone. Gone forever. He couldn't explain his feelings, but he definitely agreed with them. He needed to not just eliminate, but also humiliate the thing. You. No reaction. Do you seriously think that you're better than me? Riser was pointing at Issei, his voice had lost all its pride. Do you mere lower being think that you can compare to me? His words were met by silence. Issei didn't flinch as much as flinch. His face still passive, but the rage in his mind was slowly getting more comfortable, he found himself agreeing with it. He did not like the man. He really didn't. But he wouldn't give in that easily. The monster was trying its luck and tried finding a way inside of Issei's mind with the help of the ancient rage. Rias and her peerage were completely off the tracks, they had gone lost after Riser had suddenly turned to Issei. Not understanding what was happening they decided to stay out of the argument. The office felt the growing rage in Issei, but didn't see how she could do anything about it. She decided that she shouldn't do anything, not wanting to aggravate Issei further, so he could return into his blank state sooner. Riser couldn't bear the monotone and uninterested stare coming from Issei. He was the superior being. He was a high-class devil. How could anyone know anything compared to that? You will never stand even close to me because I am Riser Phoenix. James broke loose. Rage overcame a blank state. The death wish had been signed. He called himself Satan. He called himself ruler of devils. He had stolen from me. He had taken some of my powers and created something ugly and horrible. He had given them my name. He had retreated to the underworld, his home, before I could reach him. He had been lucky. He wouldn't be as lucky the next time we meet or I get to face what he had made. I will destroy what he calls his. I will take back what is mine. He stole from me. I will avenge myself. Prepare yourself Satan, I am coming for your fake phoenix. Issei snapped. A wave of intense killing intent hit Riser like a truck. Throwing him back a few meters. The pressure alone made it hard for Riser to breath, and the cold feeling that settled in the devil's soul made his blood almost freeze. This was pure killing intent. Due to Issei normally being in a completely blank state of emotions the killing intent poured out unfiltered, which meant that it wasn't distorted or mixed with other emotions. It was pure, giving it the ability to creep as far as into the souls of whoever was exposed to it. There it would send pure fear into the souls of those exposed and let it take over their emotions. Bringing them into a state of utter fear, panic, and shock. Riser, being directly targeted by the killing intent, was the most affected. His pride was suddenly challenged by an intense fear that was starting to take over his body. His mind broke in two. On one side he wanted to fight, believing in his immortality. On the other side he wanted to flee. Wanted to hide. Wanted to get away from Issei. He could not decide what he should do shifting in place uncontrollably. And he wasn't the only one affected. Rias and her peerage also felt the intense pure killing intent in the air, and they froze when it settled in their soul. None of them could speak nor move, they were completely shut down and could only witness as the event started unfolding. The office's soul was too resistant to be affected by the killing intent, but she was annoyed by the fact that Issei's blank state still was disturbed. Her reaction was visible this time, in the form of a frown. She realized that she couldn't do anything to make him return faster, so she once more decided to wait it out. After a while Riser's pride won the battle, due to it being natural to him and thus stronger than the fear, and he decided to fight back against the thing seated in front of him. He unleashed his own flames and quickly made a ball of fire the size of a teapot, firing it at Issei. His flames were orange. Orange for God's sake. That didn't even qualify as dragon fire, and he had the audacity to call himself a phoenix, he would pay for such foolish claims. There was a fire. Issei's presence hit like a meteor compared to his killing intent. 
It was filled with his ancient rage that had been raging inside of him. Making everything around him seem so tiny and powerless. Rias and her peerage went to their knees, not having nearly enough power to even try and present a challenge to the pressure of Issei's presence. Not even office was saved from the pressure this time, but she held herself way better than the devils. Riser was almost slammed into the ground barely able to hold his head over the floor. The fire consumed everything. But the last of his power he looked up, just to lose all hope. Issei was now standing, leaving office alone on the chair. His upper half of the face was covered in shadows, only revealing two tiny orbs of white fire that started at him menacingly. His mouth had deformed into a twisted smile showing teeth that looked way too sharp to be from a human. Around him was white fire. It was beautiful, yet powerful and menacing. An aura, black in color, coated Issei's entire body. It didn't fit with the white flames, but it seemed to really fit his twisted expression. Promising a very painful death. Some tried to oppose it. But that wasn't all. The fireball, the one riser had sent to damage Issei. The one made out of fire that was praised by all devils of the underworld. The one made out of the only fire that wasn't and could challenge hellfire. This fireball. It was melting. They were too weak. This fireball was melting. Melting. Fire wasn't supposed to melt. Hell. Fire wasn't even supposed to have the ability to turn liquid. And still there, right in front of him, all laws of physics were completely shattered by Issei, who was making liquid fire out of a fireball that he himself hadn't even created. And that wasn't even the most twisted and utterly insane part about it. No. The most insane part was that the liquid fire was dropping onto the floor and evaporating. There was nowhere they could run. Riser saw only one way out of the situation. Get back home and hide. Hide until this demon had lost him or its rage, and from then on always avoid having contact with the demon. And with that thought in mind he created a teleportation circle and started pouring energy into it when a flaming spear hit him in the back. But that didn't stop him from getting away. Or so he thought. Riser appeared in front of the Phoenix territory, shocking the guards that were standing there. He immediately got up when the pressure from Issei's killing intent and presence left him and pulled the spear out of his back, throwing it as far away as possible. Though full security, we are in great danger. Upon hearing Riser scream the guards were shocked for a second before immediately following his orders, closing all gates after letting him enter. There was nowhere they could hide. The sudden pressure made them stop in their work, and they all turned to where Riser had thrown the spear to. The spear made out of fire was growing in size, changing into a mass of flames. Then Issei appeared from the mass. His entire body was black with a violent aura around him that was also black in color. His eyes remained two small balls of pure fire, fixated on where Riser currently was, as if he could see him through the castle walls. Its teeth were also white, but way sharper and resembled those of a shark more than a human. His body had also changed. Being overall a little bit bigger, his fingers now end in sharp claws and two black wings, made out of black flames sprouting out of his back. Their defenses are too fragile. The guards, still in a state of shock, got back to fully activating the defenses when Issei started moving to the residence of the Phoenix clan. Issei let his senses scan the ginormous territory. And he felt that down there were many like Riser. Also clones of his powers and he felt his hate grow. The guards weren't an exception, like Riser and his family they also carried a tiny piece of the phoenix power. This angered him greatly. He would not allow it to exist for much longer. As the guards were already preparing the cannons, Issei launched forward in a blur of speed. Going for the closest guard and flying straight through him as the flames consumed his body and took back the phoenix inside of him. It felt satisfying. The phoenix inside of him screamed in joy. He could be finally complete once more. Their attacks are too unstable. He let his flames lose and they started consuming. One by one. No duels, no fights, it was a one-sided overkill massacre. Some didn't do anything and were curled up and crying, not wanting their lives to be over yet, with no success. Some were smart and tried running from the flames, with no success. Some were stupid, or brave some would say, and tried fighting against the flames, with no success. While his flames started surrounding the estate, he himself was slowly making his way towards the center. Everything inside would be consumed by his flames. Lord Phoenix looked out the window. How could this be happening? Why was this happening? Who's doing this? This land was slowly being consumed by white flames. They were so beautiful and yet so revolting. He hated them with all his heart he fully hated them. I need to inform the mass about this. He muttered to himself, as the door to his room was thrown open by his youngest son. Father. We are under attack by something. The head of the phoenix pillar only nodded. He didn't know what it was that was attacking them, but as it progressed through his territory, he grew angrier. His people were being slaughtered. His home was being ruined. He would have repaired everything. Walking up to the phone he filled a number, waited a moment and then spoke. 
Serzich's. I need help now. Halt. I will not allow. Issei didn't even leave him time to scream as the flames consumed the random man who dared oppose him. He was just another one with a bit of phoenix element inside of him. Nothing interesting. Nothing special. But still a step further to completing himself. But then new people arrived. They did not hold any part of him. What were they doing here? They were indeed powerful. In fact, they were the four Mayu of the underworld, also known as the four Satans. And then Issei felt something. One of them had a piece of phoenix in them. It was inactive and not that big, but there still was phoenix in him, and Issei wanted that piece of phoenix. I, Serzich's Lucifer, order you in the name of all devils to stop right now what you are doing. We are ready to tone down your punishment if you are ready to cooperate. Issei's head snapped to the red-haired one, he looked like the leader of the bunch, and he wanted Issei to stop. That would not happen, those idiots could keep flying up there not that he cared, but that one. The one with no hair. He had phoenix in him, and he would be consumed. Issei launched forward directly at Falbium Asmodius who was surprised by the sudden attack and immediately activated a multitude of defensive spells. They stopped Issei in his attack, but his flames immediately started surrounding the weakest of the four Satans, much to the shock of the other three. Serzich's was the first to come and help by launching a blast of power of destruction right at Issei. It destroyed his head in a clean blow, but not even a moment later white flames appeared for a moment before a new head was on the phoenix's shoulders. Albion was trying his best to not be consumed by the flames. Defensive magic. Offensive magic. Support magic. He tried it all, but it all failed when a tiny spark caught onto his cape and he went up in flames within seconds. The other mass watched in horror as their fellow leader, war comrade, friend was consumed by the flames and killed. In a fit of rage they attacked Issei with all their might, going by the logic that if you cut a snake's head off, its body dies. But the problem with that was that Issei's being was in the flames, he could create another body from the flames at any moment. Even if all of his flames would be distinguished, he could pull himself back into reality by sheer will. That was the power of the phoenix. And as the three remaining satans fought what they believed to be the core of the flames, Issei's consciousness controlled the remaining flames, letting them devour more of the phoenix territory. He soon reached the center of the territory. Where a giant palace stood, the personal palace of the phoenix family. The ones with the biggest pieces of phoenix inside of them. The main objectives of this quest. Even though he could, he didn't consume the other three mass seeing as there was no need for that, and he instead let them away from the territory with his body, so that they couldn't get in his way, while he would take back what was his. When the flames reached the castle's gates another manifestation of Issei's body stepped out of the flames and made its way through the castle. The flames following. There were guards around every other corner with phoenix pieces like all the other subordinates of the territory. He also came across the peerage members of the entire phoenix family. They didn't stand a chance. Their pieces were slightly bigger than the others, but now came the five biggest pieces. The two heads and their three sons. He entered the throne room of the castle and was met face to face with elder-looking nobles. One male and one female. Three brothers who looked very similar. And. And a girl. He didn't feel a part of himself from the girl. She only had his abilities, but her blood was clean of his presence. I will not allow you to harm my family any further. You monster. I will defeat you. But those words the older noble charged a fireball of impressive power and launched it at Issei. But that was nothing more than a small hindrance for the origin phoenix. His flames just ignored the fireball and disintegrated it while going for the head of the family. The man used his own flames and some defensive magic as a means to defend himself, but that utterly failed as the white flames took him and slowly started consuming him. Like Riser, Lord Phoenix wasn't immediately taken by the flames, thanks to his immense regeneration, but in contrast to Riser, Issei didn't have to make a last second attack to follow him, but used his powers to fully consume the phoenix. Father. The oldest son rushed for Issei, his body covered in those weak orange flames of his. But before he could as much as hit Issei a gigantic pillar of white fire hit him from the side and consumed him in one go. Next up were the other two brothers who tried using their powers in combination with their mothers to make any kind of significant damage. Useless. With their combined effort they couldn't even reach red flames. Issei didn't even let them finish, and as he consumed them the territory had finally fully been conquered by the flames. He was now once more complete. It felt good. Really good. Issei then looked at the little girl who was crying due to the loss of her family. The monster that by now was already in the process of taking over wanted him to kill her like all the others, but now without the ancient rage present Issei stood against the monster once more and locked it back up in the depths of his soul. There was no need for him to kill this girl. His form turned back into that of the 17-year-old boy with dead eyes and an emotionless expression. The monster had been contained once more. But he felt something towards the girl. 
she didn't have a part of his powers, so he didn't feel any hostility towards her, but she had all the traits of a phoenix, way weaker for sure, but she had them, and that made her related to him. The blood she had it came from his powers, but it wasn't part of them, so instead of intense hostility, he felt a soft familiarity coming from her. And the girl also seemed to feel it, because she stopped crying and looked into his eyes. They were filled with hope and acknowledgement. He was her family. In a twisted way, you could say that she was his daughter. Technically she was, due to being born from his powers, but it still was twisted to think about. And she suddenly felt loyal to him, her father the one she truly came from. And she felt happy. She, Ravel Phoenix had found her true family, and had been deemed worthy to be called Phoenix, by the Phoenix himself. The Phoenix had a daughter. That was indeed incredible. The three mass were truly devastated. After a long battle that was more a chase the flame monster was finally beaten by their combined efforts, but when they returned to the phoenix territory, there weren't even ashes left. No sign of the territory ever being there, only a flat surface of dirt and nothing more. The phoenix family and all their relatives and peerage members are also suspected dead. Not a single devil could be seen near the flat plain other than a giant group of reporters. The story of the phoenix clan's extinction spread through devil news faster than the fire that had consumed it. Plans to convert a part of the former territory into a graveyard for all the lives that had been lost were already confirmed by the fourth remass, including one for Falbium, who was a distant relative of the Phoenix clan and who has also been killed during the battle against the mysterious creature, now dubbed White Fire of Extinction. The creature that the three friends had fought hadn't been documented by any of the reporters and thus they claimed that the fire itself was sentient. Not wanting to strike more fear into the hearts of the devils, the three kept quiet about what they had seen and only revealed that they had beaten the entity. Oh how wrong they were. But thankfully Issei didn't have any ill will towards the devils and thus didn't plan on attacking them again. Of course that could change any moment, but right now that wasn't the case. The creature was defeated by the combined efforts of the three remaining satans. The creature's origin or intentions are still unknown right now. The king of raiding. The TV was turned off. Did you see that? Of course I did. Do you think I am blind? Calm down the both of you. I think we know what to do. Fill the fakers while they are vulnerable. Wrong. And then what? Wrong. What? Why not? I need to agree. Why shouldn't we? We should, but let us first find out where that fire originated from. It killed one of the wannabes after all, meaning that it could aid us at getting rid of the other three. I see that is indeed a good idea. Though this is gonna be fun. Thanks for watching this video. If you really enjoy this video, like subscribe and comment down below and turn on that bell notification. Don't forget to support and follow the task failer for writing that awesome fanfic and also make sure to comment on this story link in the description. See you in the next video. Goodbye.